All right, so today's video is going to be a little negative. I'm going to talk about my DNFs, disappointments, and worst books of 2020 because I feel like if you know me as a reviewer, knowing what I don't like can maybe tell you if you won't like it. Like if you have similar tastes to me, you would be like, yeah, so that's probably something I should skip. Now, if you're someone who's like, well, normally the things that bother Angela don't bother me, then you can be like, oh, maybe that's a book I'm really interested in. This happens to me all the time with these videos where I'll watch someone's videos who I'm like, oh, we usually disagree about things in fantasy. So that book you've put at number three, that's like now way higher on my TBR, that sort of thing. So and DNFs aren't necessarily like huge negatives though, as we start this video, it's just I'll, I'll explain why, but I just, I didn't finish them. So I don't have like a review for them and I don't give them ratings because I didn't finish them, but I figured I would mention them here. So the first one is Artemis by Andy Weir. I have read The Martian, but uh, Artemis was just not doing it for me. I read about 50 pages and I did not like the protagonist. She was obnoxious. I just didn't like her motivations and why she did what she did. And I didn't find her compelling. I didn't find the plot that was being presented to me interesting. I just knew that if I finished it, it'd be at most a three star. And I was like kind of in a role and I just didn't want to. I thought the world was pretty interesting. Um, it's like on a, I don't remember if it's on the moon. I think it's on the moon. And we have like this whole colony on the moon and like the logistics behind how this colony worked were really cool. And like the different caste systems and jobs, like the logistics of the world were quite interesting to me, but the actual plot and our main character just weren't doing it. So I just skipped that. And then An Unspoken Name is the second one I DNF this year. And this one, I didn't have anything that like made me turn off from it other than I just wasn't getting on with it. It just wasn't interesting me. The writing style wasn't capturing my imagination. There was a lot of telling and not showing, especially with huge jumps in our character's development. Our main character was supposed to be sacrificed for her people and is saved by this person who's like, well, if you work for me and she's an orc, but like, unless you like read that she has tusks, you really don't notice that she's an orc, which like, that's fine. I just felt like there were a lot of cool things that could have been done and weren't resonating with me. And I got like 50 to 70 pages in and I just wasn't feeling it. And so I, I put it down. So, but there are plenty of people who do love that book. Um, one of my friends, Tori, really loves it. So I'll leave her review down below so that you can see someone praising this book. Because I also know Bethany from Beautifully Bookish Bethany also really likes it. So it's definitely a polarizing book. I think you either love it or it just doesn't do it for you. And it just, I didn't get the sense that it was going to do it for me. So I just put it down. So with the DNFs out of the way, let's go into the disappointments. So these aren't bad books. <laughs> These are just books that didn't meet my expectations for them. The first one we'll talk about is Second Foundation by Isaac Asimov. This is the last book in the Foundation trilogy, and I've been slowly working my way through it. I love the first book in this trilogy, and I was like, eh, about the second one. And I didn't read these while I had the channel, so you guys can't find my thoughts. But this one I did read, and I ended up listening to the audiobook because I had been, like, dragging my feet on finishing this because I did not like some of the plot devices put into um, the second book in the series. And this one was a little better, but I really didn't like the ending. It's kind of like, I think these were published in like short story format, but it's like a collective narrative. And like the last one, I didn't like the ending. It made no sense to me. <laughs> so I was just disappointed. I know there are more books in the Foundation series. I don't know if I'll read them. I think I'm more interested in Asimov's robot series. I did like his iRobot short story collection. So that's one of the disappointing books of the year. The next one is Watchmen. This is a graphic novel that I read this year because I watched the TV show, which I know is not based off the graphic novel. It's in like the future, but it got me really into it. And Ryan bought it because he wanted to reread it. And so we both read it. And for me, I think it's thematically rich, but it, the plot was pretty boring and I couldn't latch on to characters. I, I was just disappointed in my experience. I wanted it to be more gripping and thoughtful, like how the TV show was for me. Like the TV show I thought was so cool and took the spirit of this graphic novel and put it into a modern day lens. And I didn't mind it. It's just, it, I, I wanted a four to five star experience and I got a three star experience from it, if that makes sense. Like that's why I'm slightly disappointed. There was like a really huge payoff in my opinion. Like we're following these just average people in New York City on the streets for a lot of panels, which for a lot of it felt a little weird. I'm like, why am I watching this guy who sells magazines? Like, shouldn't we be with our cast? 
of characters. And then something happens in New York City and you're like, whoa, well, this matters way more to me now. Like, I feel a little more shocked. <laughs> At least that was my experience. But there was this thing that was done that I think really brought it down was there's a comic within a comic. And I didn't like the execution of that meta insertion. I usually like books within books, but I didn't like this comic within a comic. It was a little meta for me and I didn't love it. So that's why this was a disappointment. Okay, I was just looking. The next two are fourth books in series. So that's weird. But the fourth book in the Dresden File series, um, Summer Night, was a disappointment for me. And I think this is because I listened to the audiobook, which I thought I would love because I love the narrator for that audiobook. I love Buffy. I love Spike. I think I like his British accent more than his American accent, which I don't actually remember if he's American or British, but regardless, both of his accents are fine. But I realized that I can handle the male gaze when I'm reading physically because I can like glaze over it if it's really repetitive. It just doesn't bother me. But when I'm listening to an audiobook and I can't escape it, it's just so prominent. And I'm just like, oh my gosh, Harry, you don't need to, she's so old, stop this. <laughs> like every woman, whether it's just a platonic best friend or an old fae, vampire, like every female, I have to know how long her legs are. I have to know the size of her boobs, like every single one. And I don't remember that being as big of a thing when I read the first three, and that's probably because I physically read them. And I don't actually mind that in a lot of things that I physically read. I think I just don't like it in audio. And also I just, everyone keeps saying the plot really picks up at book four, which I liked the episodic nature of the first three. Actually, if the book three, I took such a break because it had such a like sad ending. Like I liked Monster of the Week, Dresden Files, and this kind of brought in more elements of a longer arc, but I also just like, I was kind of confused most of the time. It wasn't that interesting of a story to me, I think. So I was a little disappointed because everyone's like, this is where it picks up. And I'm like, well, I didn't need it to pick up, but okay, sure. And just the combination of things made it a little disappointing. I do plan to continue eventually, <laughs> but I'm, I'm not really in a rush, if I'm honest. The next one, like I said, is also a fourth book in the series. This is Wheel of Time, The Shadow Rising. This one's disappointing because everyone says the fourth book is their favorite. Not everyone, but a lot of people. And so most of the time when people are like, okay, well, you have to work through the first three. Those are kind of more traditional fantasy, but it becomes its own thing in book four. And yes, there's definitely awesome world building that happens in the fourth book. And there is some interesting character development. But for the most part, I think if I were to currently rank the Wheel of Time books, the third book's my favorite followed by the fourth, and then the second and the first. And I guess I felt like the fourth book was the second hardest for me to read. I think Eye of the World was for sure the hardest for me to consume. But like, it just kind of was long. And it spent time on things I didn't care about. And then the th when I did care about a thing, I'm like, oh, this is gonna be so cool. I didn't get to see it happen. Like, the that happens all the time. It's like, oh, there's gonna be this cool character development thing because we just had this triggering event and now we get to watch this new thing. And then it's like, no, now we're gonna look over here and watch these trees move and people walk through these streets with this color flag. And I'm just like, yes, this enriches the world, but this was not what I cared about at the moment. And that just happened a lot. Now, there were awesome moments. The ending is my favorite ending of all the books. But I guess I was just like hoping I'd have that, yes, now this series is going to be a favorite and that feeling didn't happen. So I was disappointed. I'm still reading it. Not because I'm a masochist, which I guess maybe I am, but I have been buddy reading this with my friend Stephanie from Miss Richards Reads and I really do love buddy reading it with her. And I don't know, I, I mean, I do want to see where this story goes. I have really no idea where it's going. Um, and so I'm just hoping I'm going to try the audiobook with the physical reading next time to see if that helps me with some of my like writing style problems that I've had with the series. But those are the reasons why I made it on this list. The next one is Gideon the Ninth by Tamsin Muir. Gideon the Ninth was sold to me as an awesome, confusing sci fi fantasy necromancy thing. And I found it mostly just missing the mark on a lot of things. I have a review for this where I kind of go into it more depth and it's closer to when I read it because I read this in the spring. I think the spring, yeah. But basically, A, it's not a sci-fi. <laughs> it's set in space and there maybe are some light technological elements, but it's primarily honed into fantasy tropes, which is fine. But that kind of disappointed me because I love a good blending 
of genres. Like I, I do love that. So that that missed the mark. I didn't love Gideon as a character. Apparently she's funny and like I, humor is super subjective. I find things funny that people don't find funny all the time. I didn't notice there was humor. It wasn't a case of I <laughs> didn't like the humor. It was I didn't notice it. I found her very bland and boring and apparently she's really funny and sassy and so like that was disappointing that I got I missed out on that situation. I wanted more time with Harrow. Harrow is kind of like I don't know the frenemy with Gideon. They're going on this mission together to solve a thing to become better necromancers. I don't the plot is really confusing and it's, it's it misses the mark just a little bit, but I wanted more of Harrow perspective because she knows things and I wanted to know about this world because this world is really cool, but it's so confusing. I never get to latch on to it. And there's like, you go from this like, like championship battle thing. Like it's as like a championship sort of thing. Like you gotta, you know, succeed at tasks to become the best, but then it becomes this kind of like gothic mystery. And then it becomes this like insane, like thing. I don't, it's very confusing. And I like confusing things. I love Nine Fox Gambit. Go find someone who thinks that's not a confusing book. But I didn't like how it was executed here and I think part of that is that I couldn't connect the characters and I was mostly bored. I wasn't intrigued in my confusion. I was just confused and bored and there were too many names. If you already have a cast of 12 characters, each character needs one name. They don't need three. That's just excessive. I hear on the audiobook it's better because they have different voices but I physically read it. So that was also probably a problem. I feel like a lot of people who listen to the audiobook like it way more than me. <laughs> so maybe that's something I should have done. But I was disappointed because I wanted to like it. it. It seemed like a really cool concept and for me the execution just fell flat. This next one is The Starless Sea by Aaron Morgenstern, which is a well-loved book and I don't think it's a bad book, but boy did it play with me. <laughs> so it's very atmospheric. The setting is more of a character than the characters. It's a story that loves stories. It's 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 basically a homage to storytelling, which I love. That theme is great, but it's 500 pages and there's like no real reasonable plot, <laughs> which I don't need if I have good characters, but the characters are kind of not really there either. Like I'm saying, this is mostly like a setting and it's a thematic, you know, love story to the storytelling type of thing. And I was really into it though. The reason why this became a disappointment and not just like a book that was fine, but not for me, sort of thing is I was reading the first 300, 400 pages and then all of a sudden I was like, oh my gosh, I see the things coming together and I have my journal out and I'm writing things down to like connect the symbols to the things because this has stories within stories. I'm like, oh, this is a symbol to connect to this person and this one. And I was doing all of this stuff and I was so excited. Like there's a vlog of me way early in the channel where I'm like, okay guys, I'm finishing this within an hour. I was so excited. And then the ending happens. And in my opinion, it did not stick the landing. This is very subjective, but for me, there was not the payoff warranted in its length. I think Amara from books like, whoa, she always feels like a book needs to earn its length. I didn't think it did that, if that's the case in this one. And if it was shorter, I wouldn't have been as disappointed because I wouldn't have spent as long and been invested and not gotten what I wanted because I really wanted more. And then I even spent hours looking at reviews, written and watched reviews, not reviews, interviews, with Aaron Morgenstern and I basically learned that she like did connect things but she basically did it on the fly which is fine I'm not actually against that it's just more like oh so the big connections I thought existed kind of do but not to the extent that I would like <laughs> you know so that's why it's a disappointment but it's a book that people do love like books with Brittany and bookly bleh, book beautifully bookish Bethany <laughs> so many bees I'll have both their channels linked below. They love this book. So it definitely has its audience. That just wasn't me. Now we're gonna get into the books that are the, the worst, but really they're just books I really did not enjoy. <laughs> like, I don't think there's such thing as an objectively bad book. There's a book that has its audience everywhere. Let's start with the least of the bad, and that is Time of Contempt by Andrzej Sapkowski. I like the Witcher series. I've read five of the, I guess eight now, <laughs> including the newest short story collection. I've read most of it. I love The Last Wish. Read The Last Wish. It is, I'm gonna link actually Andy's review of The Last Wish down below because woo, it was so good. See, I have to be positive even in this negative video. I can't, <laughs> I can't handle this, but The Last Wish is so good. But Time of Contempt was so not good. <laughs> so 
I think Andrei Sapkowski messed up a little bit in how he structured the novels. I mean, probably it's the art he intended to give us, but we all wanted Geralt. And Time of Contempt severely lacks in Geralt and has so much complicated name-dropping world-building that I just could not latch on to it. You have these political scenes where you meet like 20 people and are on different sides of some dispute in a war faction that you don't know a lot about because you were primarily with Geralt, who does not care about these things. And you have to somehow, without many descriptors of appearance or anything, remember pages later, oh, this person was connected to this half of the discussion and it was so confusing. I had to read up on stuff after I read that so I could get into Baptism of Fire because it was so bad at explaining its political world building, like so bad. And like I said, you really aren't with Geralt. There aren't that many things that happened in Time of Contempt that I enjoyed and I like couldn't even tell you really what happened other than like a few things, which I won't get into because I would spoil some stuff in the series for people. But yeah, those are my main gripes <laughs> with Time of Contempt. Lack of Geralt and really rough political world building in, in my opinion. All right, the next one was actually my first book of 2020, which like most of you were not with me way back then, because that's when I started my channel. But this is Free the Darkness by Kel Cade, who I do believe has a actual, a different series out now. This was her self-published book. And I read this because it's one of my friend's favorite. And I'm so sorry that I really don't like this book, but I really, I really don't like it. It was way too long, didn't earn its length in my opinion. And it didn't finish its story. It's not a complete story for like an unfinished series that's, just kind of a questy thing, which is, again, that's a subject thing. I don't love a, we're traveling around and each time we have like a little side quest on the way to the big quest. Like that's not an engaging plot arc for me personally. But <laughs> we have a person who's the best at everything except people skills, except when he is good at people skills. I, I, I like the main character of the story, but I don't like, <sighs> I think this story should have been a farce. But it's not. It's actually taking itself seriously. And I think that in lies where I have the issue with it. <laughs> um, and I thought when I read this, because Kel is kind of an androgynous name, that this was written by a man. Because these female characters are some of the worst female characters I've read in a long time. <laughs> and it felt like such a male fantasy because every woman is falling over herself for this dude who is good at everything and is so attractive. But he doesn't understand women. He's never learned how to flirt or understood any of that. But he can take over like a whole thieving rig in like two minutes. Anyways, he like... <laughs> And I was just, no. <laughs> and yes, I had just finished one of the Wheel of Time books where that happens to Rand like all the time. But I'm just like, you're a woman and you chose this? You chose to write your characters as these two-dimensional falling over each other women? Like there's one female character who was kind of interesting. Like she was kind of like this roguish type. But <sighs> yeah, it, it really wasn't my thing. <laughs> um, I, I'm, I'm sure her newest series might be better. I think Kayla rated it on her channel. So I'm not saying all her works are like this and this might have been her first one, but I know it has like kind of a mini cult following, but it did did not work for me. <laughs> I've like perpetually lowered and lowered my rating on it as time has gone by. All right, so <laughs> these last two, because I've been kind of doing this in order from have, I have disliked kind of a bit to the most. And so I, I didn't know which way to flip this one, but Brave New World, which I have a rant review for on the channel. It's an early Angela review, but boy was I unhappy and I read a lot of classic sci-fi and I read a lot of classic sci-fi with the lens of it was written a long time ago. We don't always talk about things with a lot of nuance, right? Like this just happens. <laughs> yeah, this one was particularly rough for me. So it was written in the 30s and 40s and I know a lot of its theming is meant to be like this is a bad utopia but there were some things that were just so bad <laughs> in terms of like racism and things like that. Like, so Brave New World, we have this society where you're basically born in your into your career path and like, yeah, you're a cog in the machine, essentially. It is a pretty standard utopian dystopian sci-fi world. It's, and it's biggest flaws to me are that it's boring. It doesn't have good characters. And if you're going to be as racist as this book was, you should at least have a good plot. That's my feeling. <laughs> but it was so boring. I can't even tell you what happened, really. I remember there's this reservation. And this is where it really gets to me. This is, I think, where I have the biggest issues. If you're unfamiliar with American history, in the 30s, 20s, 40s, 
Native Americans in America, indigenous people, were very refined. They had a lot of money in oil because they owned a lot of land with oil. They were not, they were not what you see in those really bad cowboy and Indians movies sort of thing. Like these are people who have basically westernized themselves to a degree because they had money and they wanted to fit in. Like I learned about this by reading Flowers of the Killing Moon, which is about the 20s and kind of the start of the FBI and a bunch of stuff of oil. So when this book was written, <laughs> indigenous people were not like just existing in the wild with their shirts off. Like, it, you know what I mean? Like the, the stereotypes that people have of indigenous people were not true. Yet, these are the stereotypes that he uses for them. Because you have his reservation and you, our main character goes there to acquire a person who was not genetically 100% indigenous because of stuff and he brings him back to the modern thing and stuff happens. It's really boring and not very good for me. Like, I don't know. I think my issues were that I was bored. And so while I was bored, all I could notice were the things that were not done very well in terms of representation. And obviously those things have stuck with me. And I do understand that some things are sometimes used to highlight how bad certain things are. But like, I also kind of saw some papers where he like kind of approved of eugenics. So I'm not always sure that's what he was doing. <laughs> But he's not alive anymore, so he doesn't get to defend himself to me. And like, I don't really care if you like this book. That's fine. I don't think you're a bad person if you like this book. These were just things that like rubbed me the wrong way. <laughs> and in addition to that, I felt it had no real good plot or characters. Like it was a bad book before it had these bad elements. And that's why I just really didn't like it. And the last one, although not nearly as problematic as the previous one, did make me angrier. <laughs> and that is The Testaments by Margaret Atwood. I like The Handmaid's Tale. I, I've read it. I've liked it. I picked up The Testaments because it won a bunch of awards. Like The Booker Award is something I know about from my book club. And I know that's like a literary fiction award. And I read a lot of literary fiction for that book club. So I'm not an expert. But I know what's considered good literary fiction. <laughs> Like, I know it when I see it doesn't mean I always understand it or anything. But like Handmaid's Tale is a very good piece of literary fiction. Um, and that I guess if you don't know the story is like a handmaid in this rural futuristic kind of New England based world where women basically don't have power anymore. And a handmaid is a woman that's basically around to have children because there's a fertility problem. And it's a very religious state. This book came out, I think, in the 80s. I could be wrong about that, but regardless, there's a TV show for it. So I feel like a lot of people get the gist of Handmaid's Tale. The Testaments is supposed to be additional perspectives to give us more insight into the world and I guess give her fans a, an ending because they wanted it. So one, I was just, I, I really was thrown that this writing style was not the same. <laughs> this was not Margaret Atwood's writing style, at least not in the way I knew it. It read like YA dystopia, which is fine. As I say in my room, there's nothing wrong with that. I like Hunger Games, I like Divergent. Got nothing wrong with that writing style. It made it actually very easy to read. But that's not literary fiction. Does that make sense? Like it's not literary fiction, its whole point as a genre is to play around with the form of writing. It's not to be direct sentence structure to facilitate a story. Like that's not what literary fiction aims to do as a genre, I guess is what I would say. So that was a problem for me. And then I looked into it more and it won the Booker Award. And, and this usually the Booker Award goes out to one person, just one. And it went out to two people that year. And one of them was the first black woman <laughs> to win the award for her, her book. I'll, I'll put it here. I haven't read it. And Margaret Atwood, because Margaret Atwood's a big name. The Testaments does not deserve this award. And I cannot believe it got to be on the same stage as the first black woman <laughs> to win this award. It makes me so mad. Because it's also, again, like I say with Brave New World, it's not a great story. It's not very interesting. There's like no tension. It kind of gives you more about the world, but you didn't really need it. I think the TV show is doing a way better job at world building than that book did. So yeah, I did not like the Testaments. I, I went from very disappointed to very angry very quickly <laughs> for that book because I know she can do better. And it just felt like printing money, which honestly, I'm not against authors wanting money for their craft. I just think that, I don't know, it's like, I don't like when you're within a certain series um, and an author starts off with book one and book one's a certain quality and then you read book two and it changes that quality. I don't like that. Like, 
I don't mind when authors deviate from that within different works, you know, different series or different ideas, but within the same work, I'd like it to be the same type of writing, the same quality. And that just really frustrated me on so many levels and it was just exacerbated by the Booker Award stuff. And I have a rant review for that too, but I, I feel like I got it all out here, but yeah. <laughs> Um, so those are my disappointments, DNF's worst books of the year. And like I said, I have a lot of positive reviews down in the description from a bunch of my friends if you want to now go watch something good. And you do know I have a bunch of end of the year videos where I have a lot of top 10 great lists. You know, I've got fantasy, sci-fi, short story collections, and audiobooks so far. So there's a lot of positive <laughs> listing. This is just my list of things that did not hit the mark for me this year. What was something that didn't hit the mark for you? Put it in the comments and you can explain or not explain, but please no spoilers. And if you made it this far, I guess put a frowny face emoji, although I don't like that. Put a blue emoji. Yeah, something the color blue. I like that better. I don't like sadness. <laughs> and like if you liked it, subscribe if you want to, and I'll see you in the next one. Bye.